It was my first time racing in Duluth, Minnesota, and my first time running a marathon in under three hours. This is my full race recap of Grandma's Marathon. Yo, what's going on everybody? Kofuzi here, and I know I've already made a bunch of videos about my time up in Grandma's. I had the race video, which kind of gives you like what was going on in the moment, and then I made the kind of full travel vlog, the episode of Runner's Weekend. But this video specifically is a little bit of a more detailed, a little bit more for the Running Nerds account of what happened during the race, kind of what my preparations were, what my thinking was, going into making some of those strategic decisions. So the idea is maybe you're like all oh, grandma out from me this week. Totally cool. But hopefully this will help those people who are thinking about using grandma's marathon to run their next fastest race. So let's get into it first. Let's start talking about why I picked grandma's marathon to begin with because it's not easy to get to and there's not a ton of hotels. You got to book things fast. I flew from Chicago to Minneapolis and then got a rental car and drove two and a half hours north to Duluth. But the reason why people go there is because it is a generally downhill course. There's a couple of light rollers, but uh, there's like really only two notable hills throughout the course. Um, and so otherwise it's gradually downhill, which is really nice. The course is super scenic. You're running along Lake Superior, even on a very sunny day, a, pretty much a cloudless day that we had, uh, there's still some shade that the tree lined streets provide. And we had a really nice tailwind and 50 degree temperatures, like mid fifties throughout most of the race for this race. So like all really great racing conditions and the probability of getting all of those things put together on the same day is relatively high for this race. So it's one of those races, at least in the Midwest, that's well regarded as the place to go if you want to run really fast. It's a popular race for people in Chicago to go to and throughout the Midwest. And I think now people are starting to understand what this race really can be and it's going to start drawing even more people from even further around. Some people were already starting to call it kind of like the CIM of the Midwest. I kind of think of these two races as two sides of the same coin. In June you can run grandmas and in December you can run CIM. Both of them you would run for exactly the same reasons because conditions are really favorable. So let's now get into the kit that I chose for this day. I went with the a6 ventilate singlet. It's a really great material. I did end up getting a little bit of chafage uh, on the left side by the end of the race. I didn't notice it was happening. Um, it's not something that I even discovered until um, I got home or back to the hotel to take a shower. And I think it looked a lot worse than it really was because I got in the shower and I didn't really feel like I, my body, at least the upper body, had you know taken too much damage through the race. So uh, I think that the singlet was fantastic to have on. Uh, the half tights that I chose were the rabbit half tights. I really love those. They've got a pocket on each side one that can hold two gels easily on each side and like the location of the pockets is always really easy for me to get in and out. Uh, sometimes with some half tight pockets, you're like reaching a little bit too high and it's just not always like super ergonomic. I love the placement of the pockets on these rabbit half tights. And there's a zipper pocket in the back. So for a marathon, I could have two, two, and then two in the back. So that's how I carry my six gels uh, for the race. Socks were super thin Balega socks. I don't normally love Balega stuff, but they're super thin socks. They don't last forever, but they're really great for racing because they do what socks need to do, uh, but also kind of like stay out of the way. They do wear down a little bit fast, but they're really good race socks. For the hat, I went with an A6 hat. This is one that I kind of had to dig around the ASICS website to find. Uh, a lot of the newer stuff that they're making right now, as far as hats go, are like somewhere in between like a runner's hat and a cyclist hat. They, they all just kind of fit me funny. They like, it's like it's a half size too small. Not that hats come in sizes, but it just makes my big head seem even bigger. This one is like a normal runner's hat size. So I, I really like that one. Uh, and it was super comfortable and lightweight. In terms of what I was using for data collection. I was using the Garmin 255 Music with this uh, stretchy band that I put on it because that way I can tighten it really quickly and then move it further down on the wrist and have it kind of stay really nice and snug so I can get an accurate heart rate reading 
throughout the race without needing an external heart rate monitor. I did go with an external foot pod though. I went with my Stride foot pod and put that on my shoes, the Metaspeed Sky Plus. I've been running in those for a little while. I've set a couple of PRs, a 5K PR on that already. Uh, it's a shoe that really suits me well. I love the Metaspeed Sky version one. My previous marathon PR was in that shoe. And then my new marathon PR is in the second version. So I'm really liking what ASICS is doing with that shoe with the FF Turbo and the carbon fiber plate all really working well for me. I think it's a very well designed marathon shoe. The one thing that I didn't bring this time was headphones. I normally also bring an Apple Watch um, so I could usually like text my wife right away at the end of a race and also listen to music while I'm running. But this time I was gonna have Ben Johnson pacing me. So I decided I would leave that. Well, I did bring it with me, but I listened to it on the bus ride up to the start of the race, but I didn't have any music or a second watch to play music during the race. All right, now let's talk about the nutrition plan. So I guess we should kind of start the night before. Uh, I had a full day of eating, uh, a little bit of time on my feet, a shakeout run, but basically by the time we got to dinner, I did the spaghetti dinner before the race at Grandma's Marathon. I highly recommend that everybody do that. It's very little mental energy in terms of figuring out where you're gonna eat and how you're gonna get a table big enough for all your group that's with you. It's a giant, mess hall it kind of feels like uh summer camp in a way this food is very simple straightforward gonna be quick to digest and you're gonna get all the spaghetti you can eat so uh exactly the kind of thing that i want to have the day before a race and i just really enjoyed the atmosphere it was very relaxed low stress low mental energy in terms of figuring out am i going to be able to get seated and eat soon enough so i could go to bed early so i really enjoyed that before I did go to bed though, I did also take um, a bottle of Scratch. I had a, a little travel sleeve of the Hyper Hydration, I think it's called. It was like a passion fruit flavor, um, but it has a thousand milligrams of salt in it and like 16 grams of sugar. So doing a little bit of carb loading right before bed, but also doing a little bit of sodium loading as well, just to make sure that I had enough electrolytes in, and there's other electrolytes in there too, but to make sure I had enough mainly salt in the system uh, and kind of like let myself marinate, I guess, uh, overnight before the race. When we woke up, got up early, um, we didn't have to be there till 7.45 was the start. The shuttle that left, uh, there was a couple shuttles all over the place. The one that was closest to us, it's like we're actually in the shopping mall across the street from the hotel. Um, that one left at, I think, five, anywhere between 5.45 and 6.15. I shared a room with Ben Johnson for the weekend, and he likes to get up really early before the race, so that way he could start taking in calories um, before uh, he gets to the start line. So we both kind of woke up around 4 o'clock-ish, I want to say. Um, he had some uh, Martin drink that he had... Uh, ready for the morning. Uh, I had two Martin bars, like the solid bars that they just came out with. Um, those were the only like granola bars that I had uh, like lying around the house before I went out. I guess I should have bought some at the expo the day before. I didn't think of it, but I knew I had those. So I figured I would eat one right away instead of kind of like trying to find like toast and almond butter, which is my favorite kind of like morning of meal. Uh, so I ate one of those bars right away and then I saved another one to eat um, right before the race starts. Also in the morning before we left for the bus, I did have a little like sample packet of um, electrolyte pills, which I think is kind of a weird product, but I'd gotten it, I think I got it at TRE, so it's kind of old, I got it last uh, December, um, but it's from Goo and it was four pills and it's basically just like a bunch of salts and a bunch of other electrolytes. Again, I wanted to just make sure I had a lot of salt on board um, before I got to the race. As far as gels were gonna go, I brought six gels with me. Usually I like to bring four Martins and then two other gels that have caffeine and high sodium. But this time I thought I would just go with six Martins, three regular, three calf. Uh, I was a little bit worried about the sodium, but I thought I would make up for that with all the sodium loading. That's why I took like the hyperhydration the night before and then the electrolyte pills the morning of. I really thought that those electrolyte pills were gonna be tablets that I could drink, but I guess I just wasn't paying attention close enough. Um, so I ended up just taking those pills. Um, so I didn't have any salt to take on the course except for the Powerade that I was going to drink. Now this plan like would have worked out fine except for the fact that like after like the second time of taking Powerade on the course, I just 
didn't want to drink any more of the Powerade. I don't love Powerade, the flavor of it to begin with. Um, and there was just something about the cups on the on course at Grandma's that was like, I just couldn't drink out of them. And so um, I think they were all bigger than cups normally are at a marathon. Maybe it's just me, but I felt like um, I just would try to drink it in the way that I normally kind of would. You know, you do, everyone has a weird way of trying to run and drink from a cup at the same time. Um, but that didn't work for me. And I just felt like I was getting all of it sloshed up my nose and just spilling it all over myself. So after a while, I found like a way that I would just jam the cup onto my face and like basically kind of like submerge my nose <laughs> in liquid for a little bit until I could gradually drink through my mouth. So it was really weird. Uh, I had to kind of hold my breath basically as I was drinking, uh, a very weird thing to do and it was uncomfortable. So after that, I just started drinking water because then if I spilled a bunch of it, I didn't care as much. Um, and the water just felt a lot more refreshing to me than the Powerade did. So I was worried that that would lead to really bad cramping. Again, I'm always worried about my salts, um, but fortunately it didn't end up being a problem. And I think that the I was saved and got lucky because of the fact that the weather was really mild on this day. It was sunny, but it wasn't ever super hot. So I feel like in terms of sweating, I didn't sweat a ton. I did try to make sure I stayed cool throughout the race. So pretty much from like the second aid station on, I would, um, in addition to whatever I drank, I would always try and um, dump water on my front and then on the next aid station, dump water on my back. So it's just kind of alternating. So I uh, just tried to keep my upper body kind of wet with cold water for as long as I could throughout the race. Again, to, to try to keep everything cool, try to keep the heart rate down, try to keep the excess sweating down so that I wouldn't lose too many cells. I, in terms of when I was gonna eat the gels, um, I tried to eat the gels every four miles. That seems to work for me really well. Uh, plus then it gives me like my last gel with just two miles left in the race. And I kind of like having that um, feeling that you know, that last one, it's really just about like burning it all as fast as possible. Um, but it turns out that I only took five during this race because by the time I got to mile 24, when I wanted to take the last gel, I just really didn't feel like eating a gel. I didn't feel like digging in my, the back of my pocket for it. I didn't feel like trying to open it up and chew it, swallow it, all of that stuff. I just didn't really want, I didn't want it. So um, I went without it and fortunately it ended up being okay. So that's pretty much both the nutrition plan and the execution and in terms of how it went. Now let's take a look uh, and we'll go in about 5k increments just so it's not like super tedious in terms of how the race actually went. Uh, as far as the start goes, getting into the crowds is relatively easy at grandma's. You kind of just walk up whenever you want to. Lots of space so that everyone can kind of get to the group that they wanted to get to. In this sense, it's very much the opposite of what CIM was like. CIM, I thought I had plenty of time to continue doing a warm up, continue doing some drills and some strides, and then just gradually, eventually get over to the start line. But it turned out that you have to get to the corrals early at CIM because they're very packed in, very narrow, and everyone wants to get up to the front. And so there's just like a lot of like jostling for position, even just in the corrals before the gun even goes off. Grandma's is very much not like that. It's a very Midwestern race. Everyone's kind of like giving each other plenty of space and plenty of room. Uh, it's also a little bit of a smaller race too, so I think that also helps, but uh, the, the vibe on, on this day was really, really mellow. Now, normally I like to do a 10 minute jog. I do a, like to do like uh, a little bit of mobility work just to get the hips opened up. And, um, then also uh, do a couple of strides just to get the body used to the hard effort it's about to undertake. But I also didn't want to lose touch with Ben before the race because he was going to be my pacer for the day. Uh, yes, I could have run with a three hour pace group, but you know, having your own individual pacer, someone that's paced other people to under three hours before is something that's just a really nice luxury to have. It was really super generous of Ben to offer to do that for me. Um, so I didn't want to lose him before the race even started. So he said that he doesn't warm up before a race. He just walks up and starts running. And so I was like, all right, that's what I'll do today. Cause I've done that before and I had good success. I've warmed up before a race and had great success. So I'm like, 
I don't know. I'll just do what that guy's doing. So I did what Ben did uh, and I stuck with him. Uh, we lined up a little bit behind the three hour group because we wanted to keep them in front of us and then gradually pass them through the course of the race, but keeping them in front of us just as another kind of like belt and suspenders, making sure that we weren't going out too hard. The, the gun eventually goes off. I didn't really hear the gun. Like I didn't hear the women go for elite women go first, like seven, 30 and then uh, men go off uh with the citizens race at 745 or so i thought um, but i didn't hear the elite women get sent out and i hardly even heard the elite men get sent out either uh but next thing we knew everyone starts moving and we're off and running it got really crowded at that point i just felt like um, I had to kind of like walk at the beginning of this race, like the first like, you know, 100 feet uh, because there was just like a lot of people kind of like trying to figure out their space. Um, and this is an area where I normally like if I try to run a race with someone like we'll lose contact with each other within the first 100 meters of a race because the gun goes off and then I don't know what happens. I find daylight and then all of a sudden I don't know where anyone is. Um, that almost happened here. I almost lost Ben within the first like 100 feet to 100 meters of this race. But I was like, nope, I'm just going to keep his jersey in front of me. I'm going to stay here no matter how slow it feels, no matter how wrong it feels. Ben knows what he's doing. I'll follow him. So I just stayed right behind him the entire time. Eventually, we were up to speed. Um, and it was me, Ben, and Eric Floberg, who I knew was running grandma's, but um, I didn't know if I'd get a chance to see him. He found us in the corral and I was like, dude, we're going to run under three hours as well. So um, let's all run together. And eventually, we all found a rhythm and um, I was looking at my watch and the paces seemed a little bit faster than, you know, the three hour pace of six minutes, 51 seconds per mile. And uh, the power number, uh, I was thinking that we would hit something right around like 265 watts for me, according to my stride foot pod. And uh, we were right around that 265. So I felt like everything was you know, spot on and the first 5k like felt really good. Uh, there's a lot of great like energy at the beginning of the race as there is at the beginning of every marathon. Um, but here, because there's a like a train, it's like an old timey train that can bring people to the race. There's also a spectators train as well. And I feel like everyone's families, you know, kind of ride that train. That train, once the race starts, goes along and goes back towards the finish line. And so like, as it's going by you, like it blows its horn and stuff and there's lots of noise and it's super fun. Um, and so like it's just a, a really fun atmosphere and everyone's like settling in a lot of nervous energy that's coming out as chatter which I love because I'm chatty on the long run so it was just a lot of fun for that first 5k and the miles just clicked off super easy I thought there was a chip time Matt at the 5k mark but I don't see any 5k timings anywhere any official ones anyway um, so Ben said that we came through right around 21 even. So I felt like, you know, we were doing everything just about perfectly uh, on the day. Uh, and so the first 5K was super, super smooth. In the next 5K, I took my first gel. I think I had gone to my second aid station at that point, or maybe it was my first one. I'm not sure if I hit one in the first 5K or not, uh, but we're feeling really comfortable. And already, I think by that point, maybe right around the 10K mark uh, or so, that's when I believe we caught the three hour pace group, which was a lot earlier than I thought we were gonna do that. Um, and it was kind of intimidating because the three hour pace group is really big. It takes up the entire road. So you just see this wall of people ahead of you for a long time. And eventually we got up to it and then slowly started to pass it. And then behind you, you just hear this like wall of sound because everyone's shoes are super shoes and they're loud and there's still chatter going on at the 10 K mark. So you just hear this noise. And I felt like it was a weird kind of foreshadowing because I was like, you know what's going to happen? We're going to get overly ambitious, go out way ahead of the three hour pace group in this race. And then I'm going to run into problems later. And then slowly I'm going to hear that three hour pace group envelop me and pass me and I'm not going to be able to latch on. So I'm like, oh boy, this is, this does not bode well. I've done this before. I've been here before. I'm not sure about this, but I was just like, Eric's going with it. Ben's going with it. They know what they're doing. I'm going to just I'm just gonna keep with the plan and stick with Ben and Eric. The official split coming through the 10K was 41.51. So again, we're still moving at a really good pace, pretty much almost the exact same thing from uh, the first 5K to the second 5K. Uh, we're speeding up actually a little bit 
um, but you know there's a lot of downhill in the beginning of the of the course uh, so there's a lot to kind of like help you along and the nice thing about the downhill on this course that I really appreciate is that it's all usable some courses have a lot of downhill but they're so downhill that you're doing a lot of braking not on this course all the downhill is really really helpful and just doesn't ever feel like you're running downhill it's just makes it just feel just that tiny little bit easier all told the net elevation loss is about 130 feet although i had 560 feet of gain so overall i think you're looking at 600 to 700 feet of downhill running with about 560 feet of some uphill running. After the 10K point, that's when things started to get a little bit strange for me. And here's where I'm not sure if this was actually physical or just like psychosomatic in terms of like my mind playing tricks on me. At this point, we had already passed the three hour pace group. And at about mile seven, I started to feel like my left hamstring was getting a little bit twingy. If it had happened to me, like at mile 16, I would've been like, oh, not enough salt throughout the day. My leg feels like it's cramping up. But because it happened to me at mile seven, I was like, oh, this is what happens when you don't warm up. You have a weak hamstring that starts to feel like it's about to get Torn, so uh, I was like, this could be a real problem, but worrying about it isn't gonna do me any good. So I tried to put that out of my mind, and the moment that I did, I felt like suddenly I had an urgent need to go to the bathroom. And so like, there are a lot of porta potties along this course. Now there's never like a bunch of them at once. There's like two to four at a time, but they're kind of everywhere. So like every time I was like trying to take in the scenery, trying to just enjoy the race, um, I would see a bathroom and, and my body would be like, oh, we really gotta go. We should really stop here. Then if you stop, then it'll probably take so long that you shouldn't bother trying to run this three hour marathon pace so you can just kind of relax and enjoy the run. So it was, it was kind of like you were just constant temptations uh, or easy outs for me. But I was like, no, I don't think I actually need to go to the bathroom. It just feels like I really urgently need to go to the bathroom. Um, and so there's just a lot of distractions that were happening. And I think that was all kind of coinciding with the fact that like there are some rollers that go throughout the course, nothing that's um, as significant as say the rollers that are at CIM, if you've ever run that course before. Um, but there are some, and I just felt like, you know, during those uphills, I warned Ben that like, I usually like to take uphills really slow. I like to run even effort from the power meters perspective. Um, and then I usually end up running a little bit faster than most people and I'll, I'll make it up on the downhill typically. Um, and so like I was doing all that, but I don't know, whatever it was, it just felt like it was harder than it should be already before even the halfway point. Um, so I was just really starting to get nervous about things. Um, still feeling kind of like cautiously optimistic, um, but like I don't think I was the only one that was starting to feel it because the race started to get really quiet. Now we had started to put a lot of distance between us and the three hour pace group at that point, so that was part of it. But even amongst the other people that were still with us, everyone got really, really quiet and it was just kind of like you could hear shoes and breathing and, and that was pretty much it. And there is one point of this race that I think is uh, sneaky tricky and that probably set up a lot of people for a bad day later on, is that like right around mile nine, at the end of mile nine, there is like the one big uphill in the first half of the course. It's not that steep, but it is pretty long and you feel it. Um, but right after that, there's a very nice downhill. So one of the steepest downhills of the course is immediately following. So I think what happens with a lot of people is they work too hard for that long sustained gradual uphill and then they run too hard on the downhill after that. Um, that mile 10 uh, is my fastest mile of the entire race. So like definitely even I was uh, getting a little bit too excited on it. And after that downhill, I was like, well, what, what did we just do? We need to kind of like mentally regroup here, or at least I did. Um, I'll still with Ben and Eric at the time, but I was just kind of like, all right, we need to make sure we're not getting too car carried away. I didn't say that out loud, but in my mind, that's what I was thinking. Um, and I think Ben was thinking that too, because we ended up running kind of like the exact same pace. So we were 
on the same page there. Ben did a great job of kind of keeping us uh, on pace. We came through the half at 128.54, which was on the kind of the higher end of where we had talked about coming through. I said to Ben, like, you know, I'd really like to come in right around 129. I talked with Megan Murray about it the week before, and she was like, you should probably come in at 129. I was originally thinking I'd come in at 130. She said, give yourself another minute in the front. So that's what I was thinking, but I was also thinking that this course has most of its downhill in the first half. So let's come in maybe between 128 and 129, depending on like kind of wherever the effort takes us. So that way we would have a positive split intentionally for this race, but kind of like an even effort throughout the entire time. Um, so uh, I was hoping we'd come in closer to 128.30. We came in at 128.54. That's more my fault than it is Ben's. Um, I mean, not that it's Ben's fault at all. Um, it's all my fault, uh, but that's where we were. And again, it was just more of these kind of like, mm, it's starting to get hard. It shouldn't be hard yet. We're a little bit behind goal pace, not goal three hour pace, but like, I guess plan pace would be the better way to put it. So I was just overall just starting to get a little bit nervous. And then kind of like from 13 miles to 20 miles, that's when like, kind of like that was the real gauntlet of the marathon for me. Now, one of the things that I told Ben beforehand was you're going to have to watch me because at some point between like mile 13 and mile like 16, maybe up to mile 18, at some point in that stretch, I will find that I have run about two miles at about threshold effort. I do that all the time. Um, even though I know I'm going to do it, I still find myself doing it. I did it in Chicago. I did it at CIM. I did it in LA. I, I always will find a way to do it, even though I know it's a problem and it's not something that I should do. So I, I warned him about it. But that urge, that like that feeling where I just feel like I'm getting into a groove, uh, never happened. So that had me worried. The fact that I wasn't doing the thing that I always do, even though that thing is a mistake, the fact that I didn't feel that had me nervous as well. And, you know, we saw a couple more rollers and I did the thing where I fall back a little bit on the uphill, but I wasn't catching back up on the downhill. And so with each of those rollers, I was getting further and further away from Ben and Eric. And it got to the point where they were far enough away where I had to decide, like, do I let them go or like, do I do something right now? I'm like, it's early to make a move and I'm not racing to win. It's not a chase pack. Like I've never made a move before in a marathon. So, but I was like, I know what happens if I stay here. If I let them go, I won't be able to stay in front of that three hour pace group the entire time. It will, it will eventually just eat me up and, and spit me out the backside. And um, I was like, that's just gonna be a very certain but slow way of not making my goal for the day. So I knew that was a certainty if I chose that path. So I said, all right, I've got to try to latch back onto Eric and Ben. Um, so I'm going to gradually try to chop down that gap and get back up to them. Because if I can catch them again, I have a chance. I know that I have no chance if I don't. And the other thing that kind of gave me some reassurance in kind of like taking this gamble was that you know a lot of times in marathons i'll get to the point where i'm starting to feel tired and i'm worried that i'm not gonna be able to just hold it all together for the rest of the race and i get to the point where i'm like all right i'm gonna run an easy mile maybe i'll run two easy miles and then i'll feel refreshed and then i'll be able to push harder again um when i was trying to catch eric and ben I didn't feel refreshed after I'd taken a couple of easier miles. So uh, I was like, that's that's BS. That doesn't work. That doesn't happen. Um, the miles hurt. The miles were hard. They were a tough effort. But every time I passed one more mile marker, I was still there. And so I would do it again and say, we're just going to do one more. Keep it at that marathon effort. And I was really thankful that throughout the last couple of marathon training blocks, I've been incorporating long stretches of marathon effort work into like a 10 mile block of a long run. So that way I could, without the watch, without caring what the watch says, know what the body needed to put out and then whatever the pace was going to be as a result of that, that's what it would be. And so that's kind of like where I set my mental kind of like threshold. That's where I needed to be. That's where I was going to go. And every time I passed the mile marker, 
I still felt like I could keep going one more mile. Just, we'll keep doing it. Let's try it one more time. Let's just keep going. And so, you know, that's where I've kind of developed this idea that like, you know, it's a trap to think that you can ease up and then hit the gas again later. Maybe that works for other people, but it's never worked for me. What worked for me was to just put that thought aside that you want to recover for later and just know that you just need to do this next mile and then worry about the next mile when the next mile hits. That's not some sort of new marathon revelation. People have been saying that for years, but it never made sense to me until now. By the 20 mile mark, um, I was still feeling pretty terrible. At that point, I think that's around when we lost Eric. Um, Eric had to pull off to the side of the road. He had gotten ahead of Ben um, and pulled off to the side of the road. And I saw him and I was encouraging him like, come on, latch on to us, let's go. And then as we were saying that, he just started throwing up. Now he had told me earlier on in the day in the starting corral, um, because he was running in the tracks with split shorts. And I was like, where, where are you putting gels in that? Because that I know that those pants don't have enough pockets. Um, Tracksmith shorts never have enough pockets, and I know that their split shorts don't have enough pockets. So what do you do with your gels? And so he shows me he's got a flip belt on, and he fills them with chews. So he's got little packets of, uh, I think I don't know if they were, I think they were scratch chews. Um, and he's like, I, I do these because I can't do gels because they I get an upset stomach late into a marathon and I'll throw up. So I was like kind of, foreshadowing hopefully i didn't jinx him by asking him that question but even though he had to choose throughout the race he ended up having some stomach issues uh a little bit past the 20 mile marker and so we had to, to leave him on the side of the road and we kept going but right around that time as well that's also when i had that weird issue with the timing i didn't know how much time we had left so now i know that the women were supposed to leave at 7 30 the elite women were supposed to start the race at 7 30 and then the elite men and the citizens race were supposed to start at 7 45. so when i looked at the clock I saw that it said 220 on it. Now, I knew that that was relatively close to where we were at the 20 mile mark. And I didn't look, I could have looked at my watch, I guess, but I didn't look at my watch. I was just looking at the official race clock. And I was like, Ben, we've only got 40 minutes left. There's no way I can cover 6.2 miles in 40 minutes. That's just, that's, that's a really fast uh, 10K. That's faster than any other 10K split we've run so far. And so, uh, I was like, we need to slow down. There's no point in speeding up. Let's just take it easy. And Ben was like, wait, what? You want to slow down? We're right on pace. And I was like, no, that clock said 220. And he's like, no, it's 215. We have 45 minutes left. We can run seven minute miles from here on in and make it. And I was like, oh, oh, um, I don't know if I can run seven minute miles, but I'm close enough where I think I can try. At that point, I decided I was just going to give it whatever I had left, try to hit those seven minute miles if I could. And again, whatever that marathon effort that I could give was, that's what I was going to give and the time was gonna be what the time was gonna be. Ben asked if he could carry the GoPro for me because I think he saw that I was struggling a little bit and uh, I did let him take it for a little while. He filmed a couple of uh, clips, uh, but then he started to, I don't know if I slowed down or if he took off, but then there was suddenly another gap between Ben and I and I was like, oh man, what if he keeps going fast and or I slow down and he doesn't see that I've slowed down and then I don't have a GoPro for the rest of the race. So I decided that I was gonna have to catch him uh, as soon as I could so that way I could get the camera back so that at least if I didn't have a good day I would at least have footage of it either way <laughs> so eventually at the, like the next aid station he slowed down a little bit and then I got the camera back and then at that point on he kept asking if he could take it again and I was like no you're, you're not gonna take it because I was I was thinking he's gonna use this as a way to motivate me he's gonna take my camera and then run ahead and then make me chase him down so definitely just held on to the camera for myself for the rest of the race. Uh, but there really wasn't that much race left. I think there was about 5K left. And at that point, you're starting to see a lot of spectators again, a lot of the run clubs from the area and also from Minneapolis come down and give a lot of support 
to the runners that are out there, as do a lot of the other family members of everyone racing and the local community definitely all comes out. I mean, I saw people from the local community throughout the race, but you definitely see them as you start getting back into town. After you kind of hit the 20 mile mark, there is that like one big hill at mile 21 or so, it's called Lemon Drop Hill. There's an uphill, it's over an overpass, and there's a big giant like road sign that, that uh, like an electric road sign that tells you there's 4.1 miles left. You go up that hill and it flattens out and then you can't see it from the bottom of the hill when you start going up the hill. But once you get to the flat part, you see you'll flat for a while and then it goes up a little more. So that was kind of annoying, but it really wasn't that bad of a hill at the end of the day because again, on the other side of it, that's when you really start to see a lot more spectators and uh, the rest of the course feels like it's a really nice downhill the rest of the way. Elevation wise, looking at it on the map, it doesn't seem to be that much downhill, but mentally it felt like it was. So um, I just really like the way that this course finishes. Uh, you're getting back into town again. People are yelling at you like, welcome to Duluth as you come through. So it's just a really nice feeling as you're finishing this race. And then you eventually at one point make another turn. You go down a very steep hill. It's very short and it's bricked for some reason. It's not cobblestone, but it's brick. Um, so I was a little bit worried it might be slippery. It wasn't, it was fine. Um, and then you immediately go to the last overpass to get you over back to the convention center. Um, and Ben had warned me about three or four separate occasions over the weekend that you still have like a mile left. Even though it feels like you're at the finish, you still got like more than a mile left when you get that overpass to get back towards the convention center. Before we got to the 26 mile point, it started getting windy. So basically once you crossed over the overpass and got port towards the convention center, that little area is the closest we ever got to water and it got super windy. I don't know if it's just because we were that close to water or because the weather was changing on the day. It started getting very cloudy all of a sudden. And what had been generally a tailwind for like probably 90% of the race suddenly was just a giant headwind. And I kept calling out to Ben to keep coming back and try and block some of the wind for me because it's just so demoralized. But you know, I knew that there was still like about a mile left in the race, but not that much longer. So I was like, let's just, we're just going to keep going. I'm feeling fine. I'm pushing. It's hurting. I'm really digging deep, but nothing like it wasn't like other races where I felt like, you know, there were little, little tiny knives stabbing me in my quads. It didn't feel like other races where I felt like my hip was out of socket. It didn't feel like other races where I felt like I couldn't like lift my legs anymore because everything was like already cramped solid. It just hurt and I was able to push through that. Um, but at some point we got to not even the 26 mile marker. I felt like it should be coming soon, but we weren't quite there yet. And I heard a guy yelling at us. It wasn't someone we knew, but it was someone yelling at the group of us that were together like three minutes remaining. And I'm like, that must mean we're at about two hours and 57 minutes. He must know that we're trying to hit three hours in this group here. And I was like, wait, we've got three minutes left. We're not at 26 mile marker. That means I've got about a quarter mile, about about a 400 meters left, three minutes to run to 400 meters. I'm like, what's that equate to? I'm like, what? I was, I was worried about all of a sudden I was like, oh, I don't know if we're gonna make it. This is closer than I thought. So then I was like really worried because I couldn't run any harder, you know? So I was just like, I don't know if we're gonna make it anymore because I just wasn't able to do math in my head. But then at some point, you know, Ben had kept saying, we're gonna see the finish soon. We're gonna see the finish soon because I told him many times that I start to freak out when I don't know where the finish is. So he kept telling me, we're gonna see it soon. We're gonna go out and turn and then you'll see the finish. Um, after about the fourth time he said that, we did eventually see the finish soon. You make a sharp right. It's way too sharp a right turn for that stage of a, a marathon. But you make a sharp right turn and all of a sudden you could see the finish and it's probably about a quarter mile out. But there's balloons and there's people along the sides and it's the exact kind of finish that I like. Just the right amount of length that as soon as you see it, you could start kicking hard with whatever you've got left and it's not so long that you have to like pace yourself. So once you see it, you can go. Uh, and it was really great. And I felt like uh, we were going to make it. And I felt like I could keep kicking all the way through the finish. And it just felt fantastic. I mean, I was like grunting, like listening to the footage. I'm like, 
heaving, I'm grunting, I'm moaning, but like it felt good. It felt really good to kick through there. And looking at the splits, my data is all sorts of messed up. My stride foot pod and the Garmin just do not agree with each other, at least not the way I'm using them somehow. But like, no matter how I look at the data, I think I was running at least a six minute mile pace or faster for that last quarter mile. So I felt good and terrible all at the same time, but we crossed the finish line. It was really good to see as I clicked the watch that we were well under the three hour mark. I had like 258.39 as my unofficial split. The official split was 258.36. It was just such a great feeling. I went over and I gave Ben a hug right away. A lot of the people we were running with, high fives all around. It was just fantastic. Apparently there's a woman that dresses up like an old timey grandma and like welcomes every runner as you come in. I didn't even see her <laughs> at all. I see her in the footage now, but I didn't even see her. Like my, my eyes were so tunnel vision by the end of the race, uh, but it was such a good feeling. And then it took, and then as I'm coming through, I'm like, oh, there's this dude just standing here, like looking at people as they're finishing the race and I noticed it was James McCurdy. So I was like, I gave him a high five and, and I said, hi coach. And uh, we started just talking. I, I thought he would just be like, all right, some guy saying hi to me and give a high five. But he was like, how did it go? He was uh, genuinely interested in how my race went, even though I don't think he knew who I was. So um, that was really nice. That was uh, really nice to just be able to like, oh, someone that I kind of follow online and respect. So that's that's really cool. And then pretty much right after I talked to him and uh, then I did a bunch of dry heaving. And then as soon as I stood up from that, like it felt like, all of this concrete had just filled into my legs and I was just like, oh Ben, oh boy, what's happening? I can't move. <laughs> He's like, let's keep walking. And we got our space blankets and like we kept going and we got our medals and took pictures and stuff. But I was like, I, I was like, it's like I didn't have knees anymore. I was just like kind of like waddling along. And then I'm like, I think I need to sit. He's like, I don't think that's a good idea. I'm like, standing's not a good idea either. So <laughs> we did sit down for a minute. It was uh, a, a big relief to have that goal kind of taken care of, to have finished it, to have finally done it. Uh, thanks everyone for all your support uh, throughout the years that you've been watching me flail at this and unsuccessfully do it. Thanks so much to Ben Johnson for pacing me. I certainly wouldn't have been able to do it without you. Um, and uh, thanks to grandmas for putting on a great race, ASICs for sending me out there. After the race, we went over to the after party, which is a little bit of a walk away. We did pick up our finisher shirt first. You don't get the shirt by signing up for Grandma's Marathon. You only get the shirt if you finish, <laughs> which I think was funny, uh, but makes sense. Uh, and then uh, we got our beers as well. The after party area is really nice. The way they have it set up in the park there, huge bandstand area where the band can play, lots of places for families to hang out. It was a bit chilly, great for racing, chilly for hanging out. So, you know, it that kind of kept a lot of people away and I had to hurry up and rush to catch a flight home. Um, so we couldn't stick around for very long, but that's easily a place that I could spend the entire afternoon celebrating after a run or commiserating after a bad one. Um, so if you do go to grandma's, I would say, make sure you build some time into your travel schedule so you can hang out afterwards and pack some warm clothes uh, because I did pack uh, some track pants and a light jacket and I was really cold. Ben did not pack as much clothes as I did and he was also very, very cold. So um, you wanna bring some dry, warm clothes for after the race as well because the party was a lot of fun and, and worth sticking around for. So that's it. That's the full, very long, very detailed race recap. Thanks everyone again for tuning in all the way to the end. I really appreciate you guys. Hopefully you guys are staying safe out there on your runs and I will see you in the next one. Yo, what's going on?